Colorado beat San Diego State 20 to 10. Brian, uh, not the most uh, aesthetically pleasing game I've ever seen in my life. There was a a post on our message board that the thread was titled the worst football game I've seen in a long time. <laughs> well, you know, I think it probably is for those that don't watch San Diego state a lot. I mean, uh, not that I watch them all the time, but I mean, if you look at their scores, this was a San Diego site, San Diego state type of game. I mean, they, uh, you know, typically their games are going to be low scoring. Um, this was the 20th straight uh, game the San Diego State's held an opponent to 28 points or less. And it's the 31st straight time that they've held somebody under 30 points in regulation. So, uh, you know, it was low scoring, uh, but I think that's to be expected. We saw that San Diego State defense is legit, uh, but I think we also saw that so was that Buffs defense. And um, you had two pretty good defenses. And so I think if you're a fan of defense, you love today. They were without their starting quarterback, Lucas Johnson, who uh, we kind of talked about in the preview as a dual threat quarterback. You're a little concerned about him. He wasn't out there and their quarterbacks really struggled out there. They were without their top running back, Greg Bell. Uh, I think that just really allowed CU's defense to kind of pin their ears back and they played phenomenal football out there today. It, it was a thing of beauty, you know. I think it was you that, that might have asked Carl Durrell that, you know, it was like Nate Lamon and Carson Wells were, were living in that San Diego State backfield. Yeah, you know, Nate Lamon, a career-high three sacks. Uh, Carson Wells had a sack and four tackles for loss. I mean, those guys were, were awesome today. And, you know, Carson Baker, the starter uh, for San Diego State, he started the first four games of the year, but you can kind of see why they went to Lucas Johnson uh, last week. I mean, he does uh, have that element that Carson doesn't have, and they actually went to their third stringer in this game. So uh, the, the Buffs did a fantastic job. They've been doing a pretty good job against the run all year, uh, but to do it against that team against the run, uh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's more impressive to me than what they've done the first two weeks. I know it's just a Mountain West school, but that's to me, that's not just a Mountain West school. That's a That's been – Next to Boise State, probably the most consistent Mountain West school that uh, there's been in the last decade. Colorado is now 3-0 and uh, bowl eligible for just the second time in the last 13 years. I, again, I know it wasn't the prettiest game, but if you're a CU fan and you don't fall asleep with a, a smile on your face, I, I don't know what to tell you. You, you got to, especially in 2020, really, uh, you know, take everything that you can get and, and you know, embrace what this Carl Durrell team has done, overcoming adversity, not being able to play last week against Arizona State, not knowing if you're going to have an opponent. And there was even a delay in the testing today. They, they've had good flexibility. And, and I think that comes from the leadership at the top. Yeah, it really does. And you look at the fact that they found out for sure they were going to play San Diego State on Thursday night. The only chance they had to get prepared for this game was a walkthrough yesterday. They they never even had a practice to prepare for San Diego State. So, um, yeah, you have to appreciate what's going on here. Um, you know, I, you and I both did pregame spots with KOA this, uh, before the game. Mark Johnson asked me, you know, about Coach Jarrell, and I said to him, you know, I, I don't know how Mel Tucker would have handled it, but I'm not sure that you could have handled this year the way, any better than what Carl Durrell has done. Um, I just think he's done a fantastic job. You know, he he's just a no excuses type of guy. And you could tell he didn't really care for this situation and, and only have a one day. But they didn't make excuses. and They went out there and they got the job done. And um, hats off to him and his staff and those players. And even dealing with the media, I know it's over Zoom, but he puts a lot of thought into the answers he gives us. And, you know, frankly, sometimes we don't ask always genius questions. Sometimes they're, they're better than others. And, yeah. but he, he really does go out of his way to try to answer questions. And, and I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, it's a small thing, uh, but I, I don't know how you feel about it, but, you know, I like that a lot of times during answers, he'll say your name, you know, and I think it's a big thing when, when that person knows your name and you know, in the middle of an answer, he'll say, you know, you know, Brian, we did, we did this, you know, and, and I, I think that that speaks to him being a thoughtful guy, um, really thinking about the answers, but also acknowledging who asked the question to him. And, you know, I, I think he's done a great job. And um, I thought this was one of the better coaching jobs because uh, like I said, this is a good San Diego state team. They're three and three, but their three losses are against teams that, uh, that right now are 12 and zero. And I, I think Nevada's playing tonight. So we'll see what happens with them, but at least, at the moment, they're 12-0. and 0. So uh, they're not losing the, to teams that are, that are bad teams, and they've barely lost all those games. 
maybe the best moment of the game was Jalen Jackson scoring his first career touchdown in the second quarter that put puts you up 14 nothing. I mean, I don't know how many guys could have gone through what he went through with two torn ACLs and then, you know, one of his first scrimmages at CU, maybe his first scrimmage, I'm trying to remember, it was definitely during the preseason, uh, his first year on campus. I mean, there were guys that were sick seeing, you know, how gruesome the injury was. And he's come back and he's not a starter, but you know, he had big moments in that Nebraska game last year, uh, has mm-hmm. been a special teams guy. And that was, that was a cool moment to see. Yeah. In fact, I actually saw on Twitter, uh, Jack Shutak, an offensive lineman here last year posted, that was the worst injury I've ever seen on a football field. And um, you know, how happy he was to see Jalen score that touchdown. I, I would imagine that a lot of guys on that team feel the same way. Um, at least with us, Jalen seems like he's a great kid. Um, always been upbeat. Um, I'm excited for him. I think, uh, you know, it's just a little three-yard touchdown, right? <laughs> and a little flip by uh, Sam Neuer. But that's a great moment for Jalen Jackson and um, kind of nice to see that. Speaking of Sam Neuer, not his best performance of the season. Of course, you know, his worst performance during this abbreviated season, just 138 yards passing through a pick six. I was rooting for him to be able to catch up to that guy because he was he was hauling <laughs> across the field. And we know Sam Neuer can, can, can bring it. Uh, obviously, he played some safety last year. Uh, but, but Carl Drell said that Sam Neuer came up to him after the game, owned up to it, and said, I'm going to be better next week. Uh, he wasn't aided by the offensive line, and, and a lot of those snaps were off too. So uh, it wasn't just all on Sam Neuer. Um, but, again, he still has a little bit of that moxie. You know, that that pass to Jalen Jackson w- was pretty creative. And, and so, yeah. uh, you know, he, he didn't have a great game, but it, he definitely, you know, made enough plays uh, considering how good San Diego State's defense is. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Tom Brady throw pick sixes this year. So um, every quarterback is going to have those moments. I thought Sam uh, did a good job uh, throughout this game. Like you said, not as pretty as performance, but uh, I thought he did a good job against a really good defense. And, uh, you know, he's the first quarterback, uh, Adam, since Mike Machete to go 3-0 and in his first three starts. So um, credit to Sam. Uh, you know, he's, he's done a pretty good job. Um, not his best game, but I thought he, I thought he handled things well today and, and bounced back. Uh, from that interception and, and played a pretty solid second half. Jarek Broussard becomes just the second CU player in history to rush for over 100 yards in each of his first three games. Uh, fortunately, the game ended when it did because uh, he was going backwards <laughs> with his, his rushing total there at the end. I, I don't know how much of that was his fault. It didn't seem like he had any opportunity to gain any yards there, but uh, maybe the the negative here is is the CU offensive line. Again, San Diego State's front's really good. How, how much do you, uh, how much are you worried about CU's O line based on tonight's performance? Because they were really good in the first two games. Um, I would, not a lot. I think you have to worry a little bit. But um, like I said, that San Diego State defense is legit. I mean, they're they came in eighth in the country against the run, and I'm not sure CU's going to face a better front than that. I mean, they, I, I told you before the game. I, to me, they profile like Utah has in the past. And, uh, and Utah has been really good up front. I think San Diego State's the same way. You know, Arizona next week is not going to be that good up front. Uh, Utah, even two weeks from now, I don't think it's going to be – I don't think this year they're that good. So uh, – or as good as they've been. This is probably the best run defense CU is going to face. And they still got, uh, you know, over 100 yards. And Jarek Broussard finishes with 124. I think he was at 135 at one point. It was, uh, he, he, it was negative 11 yards on his last six carries. And I know some Buff fans were probably irritated with the play calling and everything. But, you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, running up the middle, what it did is it, is it uh, you know, took time off the clock. And there really was no reason for C to take a risk up 10 there because San Diego State was doing absolutely nothing on offense. And, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen maybe – you know, some play action and move the ball and get one extra score for insurance. But uh, the way San Diego State couldn't do anything on offense, there was really no risk. Katie Nixon got in there for the first time this year, had four catches for 26 yards. Vontae Chanel had a really nice game. It was his first career start, six grabs for 64 yards. But, Brian, I think they need to get Dimitri Stanley targeted more. He only was targeted twice today. He did have one nice catch on third down. Uh, no, no offense to, to Katie Nixon and I, Chenault's going to be a really good player, but Dimitri Stanley is their best receiver. And, and I think uh, you need to try to target him a little bit more than they did tonight. 
Yeah, I agree with you. You know, I'm I'm happy to see KD back, and I've really enjoyed watching him play during his career. I think he'll make some big plays. But if KD being back is at the expense of Dimitri Stanley getting targets, uh, I think that's too bad because uh, Dimitri Stanley, like you said, needs those targets. He's been their best receiver. We saw what he did a couple weeks ago against Stanford. That's not a fluke. I mean, that, that's he's their number one guy in my opinion. And um, you know, I, 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 what do you end up with? One catch, maybe. I don't remember yeah. what Dimitri ended up with, but one catch for um, ten yards, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was a big catch at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, Dimitri's got to be in that five to eight catch range, in my opinion. You know, on a game like this, and and you know, Nixon more to that. You know, three to four. I think Nixon ended up with four, but a lot more targets than that. They they got to get Dimitri Stanley more involved. Katie Nixon, it, it's probably not a fault of his own. He just does not have a very very big catch radius. Dimitri, it seems like he's got really good hands and he can kind of pluck some of those balls that maybe some other receivers on CU's roster don't get. Um, yeah. you know, obviously, again, it wasn't a, a pretty offensive performance, but CU is now 13 for 13 in the red zone this season, 11 touchdowns. Again, not a pretty performance, but they still are finding ways to score points when they get in the red zone, which has been a real big issue for this program in in a long time. And I I think that's one of the big differences in what's separating this team to being successful. Yeah. I mean, they're one of the few teams in the country that uh, that's perfect. I know they've played less games than than a lot of teams, but um, you know, 13 for 13 with 11 touchdowns, you know, sometimes you'll see, you know, 13 for 13 and it's six touchdowns, seven field goals. I mean, this is almost every time out they're, they're getting a touchdown. So um, you know, credit to them. Uh, their final ways to get it done. And we saw just last year, this team was not very good in the red zone, but uh, they've been perfect so far and uh, looking pretty good. As good as San Diego State's defense was for for most of tonight, that was not a very disciplined group. They were penalized seven times for 64 yards. And I was surprised when I looked at the, the final box score because it felt like they had way more penalties than that. Maybe it was just that one drive that, that kind of threw off my uh, perception of it. But uh you know, that, that, that they could have had a chance to win this game had they been a little bit more disciplined. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it was that second touchdown drive of CU's in the second quarter, um, four defensive penalties. So um, four of the seven came on that one drive. So maybe uh, the perception is based on that one drive, a lot of it. I mean, they really handed CU that touchdown. Uh, that was the one that ended uh, with Jalen Jackson uh, scoring, I think. But, um, it, you know, San Diego State, not real disciplined. In some of the in that regard, there was a couple other penalties that were offset uh, that you know that maybe skewed things as well. Uh, yeah. There was also I don't know how many targeting penalties that were called, but and then not flagged. But <laughs> you know it was uh, I think there was uh, all in all, Adam. I think there was as, since we're just talking about penalties, I think there was five uh, uh, reviews of plays tonight, and all five were reversed from whatever the officials called. And so uh, on the one hand, it's good that they got it right. On the other hand. That's a lot of times the officials miss the call on the field. Yeah, I get you want to have player safety in the forefront of your mind, but, you know, like the first one, for instance, the San Diego State player lowers his helmet. Why, why are you even thinking about penalizing the defense? That's, that's a part of targeting that really drives me nuts is when they really have no choice but – to have some type of contact that looks a little iffy, but how do you blame the defensive player? Because they've got to try to tackle the guy. And if he's going to lower his head, uh, that, that's part of it that, that, that frustrates me with today's college football. And again, I, I don't want to, you know, risk the health of these guys, but you can't penalize a defensive guy if, you're, if the offensive guy is going to lower his helmet. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. But I will say that that's one case where um, I, I do think as an official, if you believe you might have seen that and that's on the field, you know, who knows what it's like down there. We, none of us know. We're all looking at TV screens, but um, you know, on the field, that's one where I don't mind. They throw the flags. They think they saw it, but then let's go look at it. And then they, then they reverse it. So they made the right call in the end. Um, I don't really fault the official for, you know, I think I saw this, let's call it and just, and, and then review it. So I didn't really have a problem with that so much, but um, I w- it would have been egregious had they, uh, flagged had they kicked Makai Blackman out of that game for for uh, targeting because that was not at all targeting well I guess my counter there is you watch the replay one time yeah if you're the official down on the field it happens pretty quick 
wh why are we taking five minutes to come up with the, you right. know, an answer here? It, it's pretty clear you watch it one time, but but moving along, uh, yeah. Colorado uh, allows just ten points. That's uh, I think the the fewest they've allowed in what three years now. So. Uh, yeah. That was an impressive performance. I, I know, again, San Diego State was without their top quarterback, their top running back, but those are still scholarship athletes out there. You limit a team to 155 yards of offense. Uh, you deserve a lot of praise. We already praised Carson Wells, Nate Lamb, and they were fantastic tonight. Just the defense in general was really good. Yeah, and I, I actually had to laugh. Uh, Nate Lamb was asked about holding them to 10 points, and, and then Lamb quickly said, uh, we held them to three points, by the way, <laughs> because, you know, seven of those points were uh, were by the San Diego State defense, thanks to Sam Neuer. Um, so, yeah, the defense, uh, you know, holding them to a field goal, um, I believe it's the lowest point total since uh, a 37-3 win over Texas State back in 2017 when when Nate and, uh, and LaVisca and those guys were freshmen. So pretty impressive performance and uh, lowest yardage total uh, by a CU opponent since 2016 against Idaho State. So, you know, pretty good performance by that defense. And, uh, you know, we, we've we seen this defense. They got better from week one to week two. Uh, Coach Durrell this week said he's seeing a lot of positive things, and we saw it there tonight. Chris Miller, that, that poor young man, he cannot catch a break. He makes a nice play. And uh, yeah. I had my binoculars out. I saw him grabbing his shoulder, going to the sideline. Uh, Asked Darian Rakestraw after the game about that. I thought it was cool what he said. Is He said Chris Miller had a smile on the sidelines. There late in the game, he was coaching up Curtis Appleton, who I don't think is your long-term solution out there as a replacement, but he did get that interception late that allowed CU to run out the clock, secured victory there. Uh, we've heard Tyson Summers really praise Chris Miller for not only getting better as a football player, but his maturity, and, and that's cool. I mean, yeah. I don't know how many people could go through as many injuries as he has and, and still have a you know smile on the sideline and and be uh, you know coaching up teammates out there. Especially for him, you know, he works so hard to get back. You get injured in the first game, and then he works hard to get to get back from that, and he gets injured right away his first game back. So you know, I've always thought Chris Miller is a very talented kid. Um, whenever he's on the field, I feel like he's one of their best guys uh, on defense but he just can't stay on the field. And um, you'd like to think that maybe maybe for him uh, at this point, maybe do you shut it down, get another shoulder surgery, and he's still got a couple years left and try it again next year. But um, too bad for him. I hope he can come back because I've really enjoyed watching him play. Evan Price was two for two. He's now 13 of 16 in his college career. Were all three of those blocked that, that he's missed? 13 of 15, actually. 13 of 15, so, okay. The two of 15, that were blocked, yeah. yeah. The two that were the two that he missed were both blocked, and so you know, and he's perfect on extra points. So you know, uh, when when the ball gets past the line, <laughs> he's perfect. So uh, you got to give him credit. He's he's online and uh, and does a pretty good job. And uh, those were big field goals uh, tonight, actually. Um, you know, both of those in the second half and extend that lead to ten. So um, you know, credit to him. These are not like you know, garbage time field goals. Those were some big field goals in the second half that they needed. We saw a walk on Mac Willis get his first action. He was kicking off still a little bit short, but it didn't come back to bite them at all. Josh Watts, the punter. I mean, again, I feel like when we get to this point in these videos, we're kind of nitpicking, but he yeah. hasn't been particularly impressive as a punter. I, I don't know, maybe uh, just some nerves out there, but you know, special teams hasn't really come up as an issue that that's really costing this team yet. No, it hasn't. But you know, there was a couple times tonight that I was surprised that San Diego state didn't block the punts. I mean, there, I think it was the first one. I don't know how they missed it. You know, they've been close a couple of times and it almost looked like, uh, like Josh was, a, was a little gun shy after that. Um, but yeah, his punting average has been high thirties, which, you know, is not that impressive. And especially, at altitude. More than that. especially at altitude. So, um, you know, yeah, you would hope he gets a little bit better from that. Um, but yeah, that's certainly, that's one spot that I look at and say, well, <laughs> maybe I mean that needs to improve I mean that's maybe the one uh and punting is not huge like you said and uh it hasn't come back to bite them yet but I think that's one area that you got to look at and um you may be a little worried about going forward Arizona's up next hopefully we'll see every week is uh, an adventure in 2020 uh getting ready for these games and uh Khalil Tate has exhausted his eligibility so uh, CU fans don't have to relive that, that nightmare I mean if Khalil Tate 
could have just played against CU every week. He would have been a Heisman Trophy winner. He just feasted on the bus, but he's gone. And the Wildcats are 0-3. They lost to UCLA today. They don't think it's going to be a walk in the park. But this might yeah. be a time we see CU favored in a road conference game. It it's, feels like it's been a little while since that's been the case. Yeah, and I, I saw – I didn't get a chance to watch the Arizona game. We're doing this, you know, after our after we covered the CU game. But um, I did see that uh, Grant Gannell got injured for Arizona, their quarterback. I don't know what the extent is, so I'm not sure if they'll have him next week against Colorado or not. But um, especially if they don't, even if they do, Colorado better be favored in that game. I mean, I don't know how – I don't know how anybody can look at the way Colorado's playing and the way Arizona's playing and, and, uh, and put Arizona as a favorite. That would be – to me, that'd be absurd with the way the season's gone with those two teams. All right. Brian Leaf put out there his Pac-12 power rankings. I don't know if he's the, author- the authority on this, <laughs> but he had him number one. I don't know if I'd quite go that far, but it's been an impressive start. I don't, you know, yeah, there's a few things we nitpick here and there. And of course the fans always do, uh, but yeah. they're three and oh, you, you got to be pretty, pretty pumped up if you're a CU fan. Yeah, absolutely. And, and at this point in time, uh, you know, not only do you hope the bus continue winning, but you got to root for UCLA because if UCLA can knock off USC, uh, that's what's needed there. You got to give USC that loss. And, you know, do you root for Oregon to beat Washington? And then Pac-12 title game could be Oregon at Colorado here in a couple of weeks. So, you know, because if Colorado is the only undefeated team, guess where the Pac-12 title game is right here in Folsom Field. So, um, it, I don't, I can't believe we're saying that, <laughs> that that's even a real possibility, but I mean, that's three weeks from now, and we're talking about Colorado potentially hosting the Pac-12 title game, let alone being in it. So the Buffs are bowl eligible, but how confident are you that they're actually going to get to play in a bowl game? I guess that that's the other part of uh, the situation, right? I, I'm, I'm not that confident right now just because the more you're seeing things shut down. I mean, even today we're looking at Santa Clara County um, shutting things down for contact sports where, you know, now the, the 49ers and Stanford are looking at, okay, what are we going to do? So, I mean, I think there's going to be more of this going on in the country. And so it's going to be interesting. I mean, I saw this week one bowl projection had CU going to the, the Los Angeles Bowl. I know they're just projections. But is L.A. really going to host a bowl game when there's, they're shutting more things down? So um, I imagine more bowl games are going to be canceled. There was another one just recently today. I think the Pinstripe Bowl got canceled. So, um, but – for the bus to get in a bowl, there's only going to be a few of them left. I think they've got to be probably five and zero, six and zero, and so keep winning. And who knows? I mean, I don't think like a three and three CU is going to a bowl, but a five and one or a four and two has a better shot. Like Carl Drill said, they're going to enjoy the win tonight. So CU fans should probably do that same. And then we'll go back into living day by day mode as we cover this program. We'll be back uh, this coming week with more analysis.